Practically overnight, most of us went from never having worn a mask to masking up every time we leave the house or encounter anyone not in our bubble. It's been crucially important for public health, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we like it all that much. And part of why that might be is the effect that it has on our ability to read faces. With us now on his research on that from Thornhill, Ontario, Erez Freud, cognitive neuroscientist and assistant professor at York University's Center for Vision Research. Erez, it's good to have you on TVO tonight. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Good to have you aboard. Let's just start with something, I mean, right back to basics. How important is facial perception to human beings? So face perception is probably the most important visual ability that we have as humans. It allows us to uh, interact with other individuals, to identify their gender, their emotion, their identity. We use it all the time and we are actually sensitive to other faces right when we born, like right from the beginning of our lives. We know that even infants are already sensitive to this structure of a face, two eyes, nose, and, and, and a mouth. We, uh, or I should say, I have seen you uh, speak in the past about our brains processing faces. I think the word you use is holistically. What does that mean? So, um, when we process faces, we integrate the different aspect of the face together. So it's not the case that we process the eye as isol in isolation and then the mouth and the nose. No, we create a holistic representation of the face. We look on the face as a whole. And this is a, a very unique characteristic of face perception. Now, of course, we're in a situation and have been for about 15 months where m most of us are wearing masks a lot of the time, certainly whenever we leave our homes. How has mask wearing impaired our ability to process faces? So it, it's a great question. So obviously, since we began using the mask, we suddenly occlude part of our face. So it's not surprising that our face perception uh, um, is impaired as the result of mask wearing. But what we found, it's not only that we have this reduction in face perception abilities, it's also the case that we process faces differently. So instead of this holistic perception, which is so vital to successful face processing, we process the faces, the mask faces, in a more local fashion, like a, a, an attribute by attribute, a feature by feature, rather than to perceive the face as a whole. And what's the downside of that? Um, it basically makes our face perception abilities less successful and less useful. And it might also impact our ability to learn new faces, to memorize new faces, because we have this very efficient method to identify faces, and now we cannot employ this, this method. So we left to our own devices, in a sense, and we need to try and understand or to decode the face in a different fashion. We're actually following up this study and what, what we find is not only that our face perception abilities uh, uh, decreased for mask faces, it is also the case that we are not getting any better. So hmm. even one year into this, or one year and a half into this pandemic, our face perception abilities of mask faces are still uh, decreased in comparison to non-mask faces. Well, let me ask you about some of the testing that you've been doing, because I gather you have tested hundreds of people from around the world using something called the, or I guess a modified version of the Cambridge Face Memory Test. Just give us a uh, sort of a brief outline of what that is. Sure. So we use the, uh, the CFMT, the Cambridge Face Memory Task, which is uh, the most standardized face perception uh, uh, test out there. Uh, in this test, participants are asked to identify faces from different orientations and they need to memorize the faces. And we actually tested more than 1,000 participants in the la over the last year. In our ex experiment, we also added masks to the experiment and we can then identify the effect of mask on perceptual abilities. In addition well, to let this, me jump in here for a second, Eris, because I actually sure. we have a picture of what you do. 
So um, Tony Burke's uh, switching today. Tony, can I ask you to bring that up? Because here's, here's a picture similar to the ones that you showed participants in your test. And obviously, I, I guess I should explain this for people who are listening on podcast and can't see this. There are three circles at the top where you see an entire face. And then there are three circles below where you see eyes only because the bottom of the face from nose to chin is covered by a mask. Now, how much did adding the masks, Ares, hinder a participant's ability to read faces when you were testing this? So what we found is that this additional, that when we add the mask, we have a decrease of about 15% in recognition abilities. And again, this reduction in face perception is quite significant. Think about that. 15% of our initial ability to identify individuals is impaired because of the mask. I'm surprised it's only 15 percent, and I and I tell you that because, in my own personal experience over the last 15 months, I frequently run into people in the neighborhood or wherever out for a walk, and I know them, but I don't recognize them when their face is covered from nose to chin. Is so, it really only 15 percent? Because it feels a lot more than that to me. So it's it's 15 percent in, in in average. There are people who are more affected by the mask while others do not show the effect at all it's and again it reflects the fact that we are all different in our ability to perceive faces there are people who are really good in face perceptions while others are pretty bad and i think that the effect of the mask mirrors these kind of sensitivities to uh, uh, face information so it might be the case i don't know but it might be the case that you usually a uh, uh, look on the uh, uh, lower part of the face and rely on this part to perceive the face more. And, the, and this is the reason that you find it very difficult to identify and recognize people who wear masks. That, you know what? That makes a lot of sense because the other day, I'm going a little off the path here, but the other day I went for my second vaccine and there was somebody else there who I knew, except I didn't know them because they were wearing their mask. As soon as they spoke, I recognize the voice, but I didn't recognize their face from the mask covering. Uh, yeah, so we, I'm bad, eh? So, so we know that that person recognition relies not only on faces, right? We have biological motion, the way that we move. We have voice. And we know that people who suffer from face recognition disabilities, we call those individuals uh, prosopagnosic or fa they, they suffer from face blindness. They actually utilize those external cues those other cues to compensate for their inability to identify faces. And I guess that what happened right now is that we all, to some extent, use those other cues to compensate uh, uh, for the uh, mask effect. That's a big word that I haven't heard before. Prosopagnosic, is that the word? Yeah, prosopagnosia. Yeah, it, it refers to the inability to identify faces. Uh, there are two types of prosopagnosia. One is called acquired prosopagnosia after a brain injury, a stroke, to specific locations in the visual system, in the, in the visual cortex, um, in a region which is called the fusiform face region. Um, and the other, the, the other type of prosopagnosia is developmental or congenital prosopagnosia. Those are individuals who, from birth, exhibit difficulties in recognition of other individuals um, to, the, to the extent that those individuals cannot identify their family members, themselves, their close friends. Again, they rely on external cues on, for example, a moustache or a specific type of, of clothes. And, and they are very sensitive to changes in those cues. So if, for example, I would do, in my case, it's probably not relevant, but a haircut for me might uh, um, um, confuse individuals with uh, uh, prosopagnosia. Gotcha. Okay, that's fascinating. Now, I gather you also have other studies that show that mask wearing can actually increase feelings of solidarity between some people. Now, how does that so, work? So, so this this kind of research, this line of research, is not for my lab, but there are reports that show that uh, people who look on faces with masks find them to be more attractive and they uh, even increase the solidarity with those individuals. Um, 
Obviously, we, we still don't know what are the causes or what mediate those effects. One, one option is that the fact that we see other people wear masks, we feel, okay, we are here in this together. We are fighting this pandemic together. And, they, and those individuals uh, um, do the right thing and wear a mask. And therefore, we find or we evaluate them more positively. Uh, again, this is not my line of research, so, so I wouldn't know. Uh, but obviously, um, masks are here and there are something, I, I guess, that we are going to see in the foreseen future. And therefore, um, we have specific feelings about people who wear masks or people who do not wear masks, obviously. Well, let me follow up on that by asking a question from sort of the other side of the coin. And it's a bit of a strange question, but... Um... Well, let me just hit this on the head. There are some people who are objectively less attractive than other people. And I wonder whether mask wearing makes people more attractive because you cannot somehow see the flaws in their face. I don't know. Help me out with this one. So, so th there is one report that shows this reduction in the attractiveness of faces when they do not wear masks. Uh, there are many reasons for this effect. One effect can, one explanation can be the fact that we find the average fa face to be more attractive. And if you now hide, right, the lower part of the face, you don't know what there, what there is there. So your brain, to some extent, can complete this uh, missing part and make it an average, which makes the face to be perceived more attractive. Another explanation could be the fact that uh, again, a face which is covered by a mask is perceived as more symmetrical and we perceive more symmetrical faces to be more attractive. So there are different reasons that can explain the, the, the attractiveness of the mask faces. Let me ask you a couple of questions about kids. Are children better or worse at this than adults? It's a great question. We, we conducted one study here with school age children. Um, and we found out that children are affected uh, from uh, the mask effect. And actually, they are more affected um, uh, from uh, the mask effect than adults uh, to some extent. So the, the decrease that we found in the kid is around 20%. Um, now, obviously, here in, in, in Ontario, kids are not going to school for the last two months. So they experience, I guess, less interaction with people with masks. Right. I have two kids here that sit at home and learn from their computers. So obviously they are now exposed to to faces with no mask all the time. So I guess that they do not even uh, have the ability to get used to those mask faces. Hmm. OK, well, let me do a follow up on that. And that is, let's say at some point in the last year and a half, you had a baby and that baby has spent the first year and a half of his or her life I mean, presumably the parents aren't masked up, but presumably almost everybody else in that child's life have been wearing masks. Do we have any understanding as to whether there are any long-term consequences of that? Again, it's a great question. We know that experience is vital to shape face perception abilities. Monkeys, for example, who were raised without seeing faces did not develop the same brain mechanisms to process faces. However, at the same time, I would say that uh, um, even infants or babies that were born uh, uh, in the time of the pandemic are still exposed to some faces. I guess that they are exposed to faces over Zoom or in their screen. So I guess that they still get some experience with faces of other individuals. We don't know yet if there are any applica implications on face perception abilities. But it is important to say that the face perception system, the face processing system, is still flexible and, 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 and there is some level of plasticity even later uh, uh, in our childhood. Does it not stand to reason, though, that if the only faces you have seen as, as a baby or a, ch a child are on a television screen, as opposed to in person, that that somehow has to have an impact on your ability to read faces as you age. Of course, of course. So uh, if, we ha if we limit the experience that babies have with faces, we might limit to some extent their uh, ability to identify other faces. 
uh, again, from, from research that was done, we know that there is a, a, a thing that is, which is called the other race effect. We have an advantage in recognizing individuals from our own culture, from our own race, because we are exposed to these individuals more. And if you actually expose babies to individuals from other races, they do not show, show this effect. So um, it is the case that experience shapes our face perception abilities, but I still believe that babies uh, um, still get the sufficient amount of uh, experience with faces to develop uh, a normal face perception abilities, even these days. And I hope, I hope uh, uh, that this is the case. We don't know yet. We didn't do the research. And one thing to remember, it's now summer. People are walking outside with no mask on, masks on. So babies will get even more opportunities to gain this important experience with unmasked faces. Understood. Um, all right. Well, th this next question may not be answerable because, of course, I'm, I'm trying to find out whether five years or 10 years down the road, what the consequences of all of this might be. And the fact is, you know, you only have research from the last 15 months to draw upon. But having said that, do you have any informed speculation as to whether or not what we've gone through over the past 15 months may have, never mind kids now, adults, are we going to have long range consequences uh, to that which we've experienced over the last 15 months? So um, for this question, I think that I, I, I probably can, can have an answer. So, so far we do not find any changes in face perception abilities over the last 15 months. So we are not getting worse with unmasked faces. We are not getting better with masked faces. So it seems as if our face processing system, at least in adulthood, is quite rigid. It's not the case that we can actually train it to become much better or much worse. So there are good news. We are going to be all right in terms of identifying unmasked faces. And the bad news is that it doesn't seem the case that we are going to get better or much better with mask faces. Hmm. Does racial background play at all in our ability to uh, perceive people's faces or have difficulty perceiving people's faces? So uh, as I mentioned before, there is a, um, a well-known phenomenon which is called the other race effect. So people are better in recognizing people from their, uh, their culture and their society. But this effect is uh, um, cultural in nature. So it means that if you grow up in a more diverse society, in a more diverse culture, you are less likely to um, show this other race effect. Understood. Um, okay, Ares, I know you get this question all the time, but I know everybody who's watching this is curious. Your last name is Freud. <laughs> Are you related to Sigmund Freud? Yes, uh, but it, it's, it's pretty far away. So my grandfather was a second cousin of, of Sigmund Freud. But you actually are related to him. That's fascinating. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Un perhaps not all that unusual that you ended up sort of in the same profession then. Yes, I have my PhD in psychology after all. There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been great to have you on the agenda tonight. Thanks so much for your help on this. Thank you for inviting me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.